a few more people that are getting their drinks. But um, first of all, my name is Gregory Howell. And um, many of you know me more recently in the outfit that I'm wearing right now, which is um, my butcher coat from Water Tower Place, which was formerly the Alpha Beta meatpacking plant. And I recognize a lot of faces who have taken the tours. And we will be starting the public tours again, um, hopefully in September. Um, there's a very special announcement, and I just saw Ina Bernard sitting on the floor. Um, and I hope it's true today. So Ina has been telling me, those of you that do not stand up, Ina, Ina Bernard is the co-owner of the Artisan Textile Company, and she um, has been promised me that, that she would retire. And that's been going on for several years, and today, I think officially, you are retired. So congratulations, Ina. That was a really special announcement. There's a lot of other people I want to acknowledge, but we're going to start with the presentation since we are broadcasting this live. And I'm going to take this off so that it's a little bit more comfortable. And um, I'll just briefly say um, one of the things that I found, and I'm sure many of you feel um, similarly in terms of how we have gone through the past 15, 16, 17 months, this global shared reality, one of the things that I always felt that could be a real great way for building community is for people to break bread and to share stories. And I've only been in Pueblo 10 years, but I feel like I've been here a 1,000 years. And every time you, un, you, know, you turn over a rock, there's another great story. So one of the things that I thought would be fun is if we could really have a contemporary evening kind of speakeasy, which we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about tonight, because Pueblo was really one of the, shall we say, thought leaders in speakeasy culture during the Prohibition. But um, this particular series is really a curated series of 15 different topics. Um, and some of the speakers are here tonight, and we'll maybe introduce them later. But it's really an opportunity for the community to come together. So when we offered the speakeasy package, that was just a beverage and also an appetizer, or you can stay for dinner. But since the Senate Bar is so centrally located in downtown Pueblo, right across from City Hall and the Riverwalk, it's a great opportunity for us to go and start to, if we haven't already, patronize our local restaurants, because they've had a really tough time over the last 15 months. And we'll be working with different caterers. Yes, applause. We're so lucky. Later this year, I'll be publishing the Pueblo Food Guide, which was supposed to come out last year, which at that point had 428 establishments of food. So that's stores, that's actual bars, that's restaurants, the farms, everything. So we've gone back, and we don't know yet how many are in the total, but later this fall, the Pueblo Food Guide will be released, the first of its kind. So um, that will come out after this whole series. So I'm going to start tonight. I first want to just say thank you to Justin Brager, who is in the back with Sam Ebersol. For all of you who saw the Rocky Mountain PBS documentary, that's the film crew that produced the PBS documentary. And if you haven't seen it yet, I really encourage you to see the documentary because it's so much more than just the flood. There are so many other stories, pre-flood and post-flood, and if you really want to learn what the Conservancy District is and how powerful it is, we have a power table over here that can talk about the Conservancy District. But it's an extraordinary part of not only Colorado history, but the history of the United States. Because it isn't every day that you give permission to a town to move a road, to move a railroad, to move you know things that usually would be left up to state or federal governments. So that was a really powerful uh, right to obtain, but there was something in exchange. And it's a spoiler alert, so I won't tell you the whole story. You've got to watch the documentary. 
So I'm going to go through tunnels, brothels, and bars, oh my, as the introductory lecture. And you'll get bits and pieces of what I've talked about before. But what I really want to encourage with this presentation is somewhat of a discussion because one of the things that many cities have done, both in Europe and also in the United States, have really embraced and celebrated and taken advantage of their underground. And when I say underground, tunnels, of course, is one of the things. I mean, there's books written about it. Most people even have their own private tunnels in some neighborhoods. One of the tricky things about this presentation is there's still a lot of gray area because a lot of these tunnels the city doesn't know if they're responsible, is the owner responsible, and there are safety and security issues. But I think there's a huge opportunity, not only with the tunnels, but we also have an archaeological dig right in downtown. And that's extraordinary. So I think there's a huge opportunity to create an underground destination or an underground attraction, which really captures a lot of what happened here in Pueblo. And in many cases, since Prohibition hit Pueblo, well, Colorado, um, almost four years before the nation went dry, we really got a head start in terms of being thought leaders in Prohibition. <laughs> so what we're going to look at today is um, the underground fascination, um, a town called Town, Empire Builders, Banks, Brothels, and Bars, oh my. You can see how I put the banks in there, too. Uh, prohibition, Tunnel Legacy, 4,004 Nights, and the Future of the Past. And this underground fascination is not unique just to Pueblo. When I first came to Pueblo 10 years ago, and I was living in the historic Tut Building, which is right across from Legacy Bank on Central Plaza. Um, when I first went in the building and went into the basement and started opening up doors that looked like closets, they were actually doorways into the underground tunnel network here in downtown Pueblo. Beautiful, you know, granite foundations, arch, stonework, brickwork, uh, a truly amazing craftsmanship in terms of how that was done. But really, if you just talk about tunnels in general, um, you can go to Scotland and Ireland and all over England, and these are the Elfcombs. These are actual, they thought they were elf tunnels, um, but they are actually natural to the environment. And many of the estates, um, this is just one of them, took advantage of some of the natural conditions that are found in a cave. Many of you are probably familiar with wine. Wine, it's a very you know, good, safe, controlled environment for wine and for storage. Uh, many cultures use the underground for storing dried food, pickled food. Um, this is actually the longest tunnel in the world, which is actually in Kentucky, which is 357 miles long. So when we talk about tunnels, generally they're short, but there are natural tunnels that really go quite a distance. These are some of the ice houses we're familiar with the ice house at the old Alpha Beta, the meatpacking plant. These are the doorways to the ice houses and mostly found on country estates. But they are entrances into an entire tunnel network. And of course, if you're a young child or if you're just someone who is um, uh, into storytelling and wants to create stories, uh, there are so many written accounts of truly what the origins of are of these particular tunnels. But really, Paris is the destination that really kind of took the world by storm um, in terms of how you can take advantage of an underground kind of city. Um, underneath Paris, there are these extravagant limestone quarries, uh, which they were a natural resource. And since the time of the Romans providing construction material for Paris's buildings. And if you walk around Paris, one of the great things is you know, you can kind of look at the buildings and you can just see the origin of that stone. It's not uncommon in Pueblo where we look at these beautiful buildings, many from the 1880s, 1890s. 
not only is there brick, but you'll find the Manitou, the redstone, that sandstone, which are not only sidewalks in Pueblo, but oftentimes the sills of windows. You'll find them in ornamentation, carved rosettes. There's quite a few right here in downtown. So just, you know, the source of those materials also provides great attraction. Um, since the catacombs were officially opened to the public in 1876, the catacombs have attracted the interest of thousands of visitors and historical figures like King Charles X, who is said to have thrown wild parties there, and also Napoleon III. The majority of the network has been off limits since 1955, but even in the areas still accessible to tourists are fascinating remnants of Paris's history. They were used by the French resistance to hide from Nazis in World War II, and ironically, by the Nazis who used them as underground bunkers. So over time, I mean, this is just a map of what the tunnels look like just in Paris, the catacombs. And this was from 1857. So when you start looking at time and timelines, if you think 1857, you know, those were the early years of Pueblo, when you start looking at the actual founding of the city. We can go back, I have found now, there are about four families that can trace their roots back to 1608, right here in this region. So when you look at uh, 1857, that's pretty much when Pueblo started to actually build its cities. There's also a group called the Catafils, and I would love if Pueblo could come up with a kind of an underground subculture, but this is an entire group of explorers known for entering the network illegally. Not that I'm encouraging that. <laughs> but the Catafils have been going deep underground into the catacombs for years, hosting everything from bars to movie screenings in the subterranean world. So the next real part to talk about when you start looking at what we already have and what exists is just looking a little bit at the empire builders. And there's quite a few. The Guggenheims, the Rockefellers are the most notable in terms of global empire builders. And both really created much of their early fortune here in Pueblo. Um, originally in Leadville, came back to Pueblo and expanded that fortune. Um, but the Guggenheims really um, I'm really affiliated now closely with the Knuckles family who founded the meatpacking plant, which we for refer to as Alpha Beta, now Water Tower Place. But it was the Guggenheims and the Knuckles family that really were breaking extensive ground up in Leadville because of the silver mining. And both families actually, when that started to wane, came down to Pueblo, and even the Guggenheims, the, the um, the Knuckles family, one of the reasons why they wanted to come back to Pueblo was not only because of economic opportunity, but because of the weather. It was a very pleasant place to settle and have fortune. So Meyer Guggenheim, Daniel Guggenheim, I won't get into a lot of details about the Guggenheims. Benjamin Guggenheim was, of course, for those of you that are Titanic fans, he was with his French mistress on the Titanic when it sunk. So. Um, a lot of really interesting connections if you start looking at global history. John D. Rockefeller Jr., um, single longest continuous ownership of the steel mill uh, was with the Rockefeller family. And of course, the Ludlow Massacre really was that turning point when the Rockefeller family really switched from empire building to philanthropy. It was really a trigger in their particular pathway. Um, if you haven't heard the testimony of Rockefeller when he had to explain what was going on during Ludlow, um, it's pretty extraordinary, pretty extraordinary, and I would encourage everyone to look at that closely. But at the steel mill, too, there are tunnels, um, simple tunnels. There are other tunnels that are not talked about. The one thing that I've learned in Pueblo is never talk to management. Always talk to the workers. <laughs> The workers will tell you exactly what happened there, either on the floor or while they worked, or because um, the ownership, of course, I can understand that. There's lots of liabilities in that regard. But the main gate tunnels, which of course are right out in front of um, the original dispensary, and of course now there's the steelworks part. And um, has everyone seen the steelworks part, the new steelworks part? I mean, it's extraordinary. There's about 
correct me if I'm, if 14, 15 objects, Kareem, um, that were pulled out of the original steel mill, one as large as a 130 ton ladle. But these were objects that were, of course, exclusively used in the plant that are now outdoors in an outdoor park right outside of the dispensary and then across from the stacks. So I would highly encourage you, plus, um, Gregory Poltanovich, who's an amazing bronze sculptor, created the iconic steel worker with the ladle, which is one of the uh, iconic um, kind of gateway greeters, shall we say, right at the entrance to the park. But this is what the tunnels look like. And of course, you go down through the turnstiles, and then you would go under I-25. You would go from uh, west to east, and then at the end of your shift, you would come back the other way. What I love is, one. This little building is, is kind of nice, but I don't have a picture of it here, but on the other side is this gorgeous brick little, it looks like a typical New York Brooklyn subway station. And I hope they do make sure that that is preserved. Um, just some other empire builders that are connected with our downtown. William Martin Aiken was the great architect who did the historic federal building at Fifth and Main. But he was prolific. I mean, he did the Philadelphia and the Denver Mints. He did the Justice Building and the Courthouse in San Francisco. I mean, this gentleman was extraordinary. And he was only in Pueblo just for a short period of time in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And he then left Pueblo and went to become the chief architect for the city of Manhattan. So he did amazing things. In fact, one of his most celebrated, before I get there, this is an amazing collection, and I'm, I'm in the middle of bringing this to Pueblo, but William Martin Aiken traveled the world. He was originally from South Carolina, but traveled the world and did these incredible drawings, sketches, watercolors, and if you look at the historic federal building, most of that is Italian palazzo. It looks like a Doge Venetian palace if you really look at the details. And when you look at his drawings, they, they really indicate where his kind of his inspiration, where his influence came from. But I have located all of these original drawings in the colleges of the Carolinas, and they are willing to let us have them here in Pueblo for an exhibition. So I would really love to do something because their drawings are extraordinary. And this, of course, is the building at Fifth and Main. I know many of us here, we lived there practically when we were working 10, 10 11 years ago. This was the famous bathhouse that um, William Mark Nakin did in downtown Manhattan. Tragically, he died on an operating table at the age of 52. We know very little other than that. Hans Peter Henschen, the Norwegian, who built Alpha Beta. And Alpha Beta, uh, well, Knuckles at the time, um, he built 300 of these plants around the world. This was the very first that he did. I'm working with the Norwegian government right now and with several of their foundations um, to honor Hans Peter Henschen. And we're actually about to send out an RFP to about 10 contemporary Norwegian architects to do a special museum or an addition to Water Tower Place to honor him. Um, and I didn't put, we have lots of tunnels. When you come on the tours, I think we started showing the tunnels. Now we have opened up most of the tunnels downstairs because they're all connected to what is known as the ventilation chamber, the lungs of the building. The building really does breathe. And we talk about ventilation now after COVID. And 100 years ago, they knew how to ventilate a building that was 250,000 square feet naturally using tunnels, high pressure air system outside. The air rises. And at the end of the day, when it gets cold, the air drops. Brothels. I don't know if any of you have seen this book. It's The Red Light Women of the Rocky Mountains by Ian Mc Jan McKell. Um, this was from the University of Northern New Mexico. It's an extraordinary book, um, which really does go into, um, there's a whole section on Pueblo. And I'm just in the middle of digging into this right now because I didn't realize how powerful prohibition was for single mothers it created so many opportunities for revenue generating, but also many of the original landowners. It's tricky because when you read the census and you look at who really owned the land, many of these madams actually were very, very 
clever in the manner in which they own the real estate in downtown. And um, we're, I'm in the middle of digging into this. And of course, prohibition is a huge part of that whole conversation. When you look at um, prostitution, you look at prohibition. Um, but 1916 to 1933 was the full period for this particular region. Um, and it really, what's interesting when you start looking at what prohibition, if you think about Pueblo and the unique nature of immigrants, blue collar, hardworking people that were working in the mills or the meatpacking plant or any of those supporting industries, even if you were out in the mines, one of the last things you're gonna do is tell someone from any other country that you can't drink after work. So what it really did was it forced everything to go underground. Now Pueblo in the early, I should say the late 1800s, during its kind of first round, if you look at a lot of the building tops, you'll notice that a lot of the great buildings, 1890 seems to be a big number. You'll see a lot of great buildings. But even before that and after that, there were still a lot of horses and liveries in downtown. And so the notion of sidewalks was still not yet you know, part of the urban planning kind of um, mindset. So much of what we find in downtown, a lot of the buildings that were built in the 1890s, um, and you can kind of see, I can't tell you where these are. <laughs> I hope to be able to tell you these. There's probably about a mile of tunnels just in downtown alone. Um, but we know these as hollow sidewalks. And because they didn't have what we know today to be a traditional sidewalk, they had in front of the building underground these unique storage rooms. Um, they were also for drop and transfer, um, also for bootleg. It was very, very convenient. So you're starting to see how there was already this infrastructure that was built in these frontier towns that were constantly developing. And there was existing places where you could make easy drops and things of that sort. Uh, Sugar Moon, of course, was one of Pueblo's most famous um, bootleg beverages, which was made from sugar beets. And then Leadville Moon, the legend is, is that you had to take overalls or dungarees from one of the miners and you had to use it to swish the actual Leadville Moon. That's what they say. And then Blind Tigers, this is a mystery, but this was the most popular speakeasy in Pueblo called the Blind Tigers. And I am really on the hunt. And one of the great things, like when I do the tours at Water Tower Place, I always ask, did someone work here before? Or do you know some? Because it's usually Pueblo, I have a new t-shirt that's gonna say Pueblo, one degree of separation. Because really, it's extraordinary. You, you know, sometimes you know, your Pueblo cousins are closer than your real cousins. But it's really amazing how you have this amazing um, ecosystem of resources. And so um, when I do the tours, and again, this gets back to never talk to management, always talk to the workers. When I want to learn about the blind tigers, it's conversations like this where people will either know or they'll go home. Um, or I'll learn from neighborhoods who are still reluctant to share because I have visited several neighbors and neighborhoods in town where there are tunnels that go underneath their houses. And this all dates back to the 1920s. And I have to sign NDAs, you know, every time I go. So, you know, they're, they're, I think there really needs to be a robust conversation so that all of these can be celebrated. Maybe it's like one of those home tours, you know, that you do. We get to go out and explore some of these tunnels in other neighborhoods. It's extraordinary. So this is just a recent, does anyone know where this is in downtown? Out in front of the Great Divide? So this was an amazing, you know, the city decided they were gonna redo all the corners and they needed to tear out the corners and redo all of that. They started digging and all of a sudden, all of these hollow sidewalks. You can actually go on YouTube and you can watch this actually happen. This is just a clip of that. But you can see down below and when I get to some other pictures, you can kind of see here you'll start to see other structures. These, they had to put in I-beams and other supports, but there are entire walkways underground with doorways. Oh, I do have the video. I didn't know I had the video.
I think I'm just going to pass on that right now just because of time. But it is available. So um, <laughs> let me make sure. Yeah, I'm on the right one. <laughs> this is where it gets really fun. <laughs> So a lot of people talk about, do you know why we call speakeasies, speakeasies? You have to speak easy. You have to speak easy. You had to be quiet. So um, there are a list of rules that you had when you went to a speakeasy. Very, very strict, but the whole thing was to speak easy, keep it quiet, because it was, of course, you know, prohibited. But the um, hiding hooch. So hooch is actually from an Alaskan beverage um, that native Alaskans would make called Hoochinu. And it was during the Klondike when they were up, you know, doing all kinds of the discoveries up in Alaska that they started to share and trade. And they loved this Hoochinu, which eventually as it worked its way down from Alaska down to um, Washington State, Oregon, and then San Francisco, there's a lot of talk about um, bootlegging and hooch. But all of these are different ways in which women in particular, they would use the cane, they had them in their shoes, and of course with the garter. But this whole bootlegging, um, things got really extravagant. They called them cow shoes. And so they would find almost every space possible where they could hide something to drink. I mean, if you think about it, it's pretty extraordinary what people would go to, not only just to be able to socialize, but to socialize with an alcoholic beverage. I don't know how comfortable those shoes are, but at least he has nice trousers and they're all tailored and everything. <laughs> so, but this is where it gets really fun too. So this is a ditty. So four and 20 Yankees, feeling very dry, went across the border to get a drink of rye. When the rye was opened, the Yanks began to sing, God bless America, but God save the All of this was possible. Uh, God bless America, but God save the king. So 4,000 peop 4, people, four nights, Tunnel Legacy. So as I said earlier, I lived uh, in the historic Tut building. And when I started to open up those doors down below, all of a sudden it opened up into these beautiful tunnel chambers and actual rooms that you could sit in. And I lived there for six years, and every year the ghost walk asked me to actually do a presentation. And um, for those of you that are familiar with the ghost walk, you usually walk around and a presentation is done outside of a particular building or location. So in 2016, I said yes. And I told them it was the first time the ghost walk had ever allowed people to go inside of a building. So I said, well, because you've never done this before, let's make the Tut Building your first stop. And I said, no more than 20 people per group. It ended up being about 90 to 100 people per group. We had 4,000 people come through in four nights. But the most amazing thing, and the reason why it's so important to talk about, is there were five-year-olds and 95-year-olds in these groups. And it was just as fascinating. And we always have this kind of element of urban fiction. And you wonder, you know, I've only been here 10 years, and some people think I make this stuff up. I don't. You know, I just, I just love stories. But, um, you know, when you listen, you know, I was talking to people who were in their 80s and 90s, and these were places that they played when they were kids. And they were just tunnels. They were just tunnels because they were there. But you tell a five-year-old, you know, that we're going to go down in the tunnels, and they're right at the front of the line. So when we start talking about, you know, adaptive reuse of historic properties, we start talking about economic development, we start talking about tourism. I have worked around the world for cities who would die to have those three things because that is the sweet spot for any city. 
So that's one thing where I think these stories become so incredibly important. Those, the Seattle Underground is really interesting because in the 1950s, they started to do some digging near Pioneer Square. And all of a sudden, I'll show you what it looked like, but again, you start to see how there is this subterranean culture. Here is what they found. <laughs> So if you look at that, it's pretty extraordinary. And that is not different. This is pretty dramatic in terms of the levels and everything. But in 1958, they looked at this and they said, a small group said, this is a tourist attraction. This is a destination. This is fascinating. And it is one of the number one, other than, um, what's the market? Um, Pike's Mark. Other than the market, I think the Seattle Tunnels is like one of their number one attractions. Um, but it lacks what Pueblo has in terms of that historical, cultural, I mean, they have similar things, but we were so much at the epicenter of that because of the prominence of Pueblo at the time. And of course, when you've got Guggenheims and Rockefellers running around as empire builders, and you've got a steel mill, and you've got meatpacking, and you're building the West, you know, there was a lot going dry four years earlier, again, back to thought leadership, um, but Seattle has really taken advantage of this. Similar to, I mean, for those of you who have taken the catacombs tour in Paris, every time I take it, when I get out at the end, I'm just standing next to like a bakery, you know, or some, some tiny little place, and I find that fascinating. So um, this is an aerial view of, of Water Tower Place, um, Acme, the Knuckles Packing Company, but here too, um, just to give you an idea, um, and importantly so, because we have two tunnels that were built in the 1880s that go under the Missouri Pacific lines on our north side of our property, which are closed now, but hopefully by next fall, I would say maybe 2022 fall. I always say that and then I have to say, no, it's gonna be fall 2023. But fall 2022, um, we will open up right to the Riverwalk at Gateway Park. So you could walk literally from here in about 10 minutes and you would walk right into the property. So these are all a 12 by 12, just to give you an idea. These are all the tunnels that when we have a high pressure system, all the cold air from the tunnel breathes up through the building and you can literally feel it in certain parts of the building and then at the end of the day you can feel it drop back down. So beautiful because the building has no load bearing walls and it was designed in clusters so that you could be very flexible and innovative with your production lines. So these tunnels were really, really important. They used them for other things, but to get air in and out, it was extraordinary. So that is um, a lovely picture of the levee as it was going down. Um, but uh, questions, um, we're right now, good time, 6.50. I wanted to try to keep it shorter. Um, but I think one of the things that I would really, and, and I have to say, there's a few people too. Um, Wade Broadhead is sitting in the room, and we are so lucky to have this man back in Pueblo, who for many, many, many years um, got me really excited about Pueblo 10 years ago, when you talk about historic preservation. And Wade is one of our thought leaders, not only just here, but nationally. He participates in conferences, in workshops, in seminars. And I was very saddened when he went to that little town just to the west, to Florence, and has since returned. And Wade is right here in the front. And all I can say is, I mean, you can talk to Wade. He's just only been on the job, what, two weeks now? <laughs> Four weeks now? Has it been four weeks already? My gosh. But um, when he tells me how many applications are going in for this project, how many applications are going in for this project, I mean, it's, you probably haven't seen that. Um, I know not during your tenure. So it also gives us all a great indication of just what is happening here in Pueblo. And I came to Pueblo 10 years ago, as I said, and um, I grew up on a movie set in Southern California, literally. So MASH. Oregon Trail, Little House on the Prairie. I lived on that movie set. Gilligan was one neighbor. Alice Cooper was another neighbor. So I had a very kind of interesting childhood. But when I got to Pueblo, the very first week, just walking around, I just thought, this place is a, is a back lot. It's like a movie set. 
And we have three film production companies a week now in Pueblo filming. So thanks to Governor Hickenlooper, uh, 2018, when I brought Harley Davidson here, secretly they shot the 2019 models in Pueblo. It went viral, 22 million people. We printed 500,000 calendars. So he enabled us to start the Pueblo Regional Film Commission. So we've been very active in that regard. So what I love now is that we've got a great group of young people on the Historic Preservation Commission. I consider myself old, but I'll always be 12, never 13. But, um, but now that we have Wade back, he is really going to be spearheading and doing a lot of work for us in historic preservation. And I lecture regularly in the state and actually uh, throughout the country and overseas. And two weeks ago, the Colorado Association of Realtors called me and Denver was just listed, and I don't know what list they got, but uh, was listed as the second most gentrified city in the US, which is kind of not a good thing to have. <laughs> and they said, you guys in Pueblo are doing amazing things with your historic buildings. I mean, we've got Water Tower Place, we've got Holmes Hardware, we've got Keating Junior High School, and I'm so excited about Keating Junior High School and what Corrine in this table over here and Carla and Wade and Jeff Medine in the back. I know there's a whole bunch of people, but all of a sudden there's this really great critical mass. And so for me, as we crawl out of our caves from the pandemic, uh, breaking bread and sharing stories is probably the best thing that we can do. And there's nothing better than stories that are rooted in our own neighborhood. So over the next 14 weeks, there's a wide variety of speakers. Um, some of them are in the room. I encourage you to talk to them if you want to know who they are. But next year, what we're hoping to do is buildings and neighborhoods. And we're gonna take the dig on the road. And we're gonna go to a neighborhood for like four Wednesdays. And we'll talk about that neighborhood. And then we'll encourage everyone to eat in the local restaurants and to just check out that neighborhood. So that's one reason why the Pueblo Food Guide we decided would wait until later. But again, that's the other best thing is to explore this town food. I, I, I'm a huge foodie. But um, when you can put a story with food, that's pretty sweet. Are there any questions? Yes. So the history of the Senate, thank you for reminding me, Ken. The owner of the Senate bar, both Ken and his wife here, they are extraordinary. And this building has, yes, please. So the, what's interesting about this building is it, it also has a lot to do with the man who built the building next door, John E. Vale, who is in media, who is in publishing, and of course, there was the Star Journal newspaper, which early on, they were competitors. And then, of course, sometimes competitors become good friends or one eats up the other. But um, you had the morning paper and then you had the evening paper. But Johnny Vale was the gentleman who actually um, built the building, the Vale Hotel, and of course, built this particular building where the Star Journal is. Um, and this building is part of the Union Avenue Historic District. So there is an entire district here, and all of these buildings, many of them stand alone in terms of their own recognition on the National Register of Historic Places, but many of them are contributing. So when you apply for, and this is, Wade could do a lesson on this, but just briefly, the beauty of a historic district is when you look at the whole entire area and you look at certain criteria, and you look at all of the buildings, there is a critical mass there. And of course, you can kind of feel that here in this area. But um, this particular building, which um, was very much a part of the underground and very much a part of the speakeasy culture. And uh, soon, we have started to take some pictures. Um, and, and I have dozens of pictures that we'll be able to show. Again, we're in that very sensitive place right now where um, the city is just wanting us not to say so much about where the tunnels are located 
because you know we've got tunnels at the state hospital, we've got tunnels at the steel mill, we've got a lot of other tunnels, but in this whole region here, where we are, there's an extensive network of tunnels. And Wade just sent me a photograph too, and you're gonna give me another green. But Wade just sent me a picture. Again, this is the year of the flood. And this, now that was, you, that, was that the same building this, that you showed me, the, the photos of all the silt from the flood? So this is what's extraordinary. I mean, and I won't say much about the documentary because you gotta see it, it's amazing. And there are a lot of spoiler alerts. But when you watch the documentary and you realize, and I think Lucille Corsentino said a beautiful thing about how much work it was to clean up all of the mud, but Wade showed me a picture where they have, they're doing some um, interior work on one of our historic buildings, and they cut up one of the floors and pulled up the floorboards, and all of the silt is still there, perfectly intact, all cracked from the flood. I thought that was amazing. And they just built a floor right over the top of it. But it's perfectly intact and it's beautiful. It'd be really cool if they could put it between glass or something. It looks really neat. But, um, but no, so this downtown area and the Senate bar, this particular building, um, and I just literally got a whole stack of pictures uh, through the National Archives on this building. And so what I'm gonna be trying to do is through the Facebook page and also through these presentations, we're gonna try to elaborate more and more. So this year is unique in that every presentation will be here because we're kind of creating this contemporary speakeasy. So um, next year it'll change. But um, throughout this presentation, we will actually, and maybe, Wade, can you hold the mic for me since you're already my assistant? <laughs> taglines so we have a new t-shirt which will be available shortly which has this logo the Senate barn grill the dig but at the bottom it says Pueblo leaves you speechless and then turns you into a storyteller another question oh so would you, would you name where some of the tunnels are? <laughs> well, I can tell you where a lot of the groupings are. Um, so you did see um, at 4th and Santa Fe, um, that's just a really easy example, but there's a lot of clues. When you walk on the sidewalks of Pueblo, you can find a lot of clues. If you find sidewalks that are still Manitou redstone slabs, more than likely, underneath there is going to be some type of a hollow sidewalk. When I was first exploring these downtown ones, so if you think of First and Main, I always say First and Main. What is it, Civic Center Drive? Or what? Um, the down, right there where Legacy Bank is, right there by the Headwaters Fountain. That particular location there, um, there's, a, there's a whole network. Some of the buildings, of course, have closed them off just for safety and security reasons. But downtown has them. The B Street area has quite a few. Uh, many of them are open and closed. Um, but you can almost walk down Main Street and then cross over and take Union. And if you go down into the basements of many of the buildings, depending upon their status and their shape and how structurally sound they are, if you look towards the sidewalks, you can usually see. But where I was on Central Plaza, I was amazed because I got into the tunnels and I can stand in them and I could see above me beautiful Manitou redstone slabs. So I've been trying to find the original photos. I have found many photos, but most of the photos are when they actually poured the concrete, you know, but it, they just poured it right on top of these beautiful Manitou, and they have rebar, and they've got I-beams and everything underneath it. So structurally in some areas, they've actually just left those kind of passageways open 
but many property owners have actually started to close them off. So when you walk through a tunnel, you, it'll end, but if you were to go upstairs and go into the building and then go inside and go down to the basement, you can go into the tunnel but you, on the other side of the wall. So a lot of it has to do with, because I was shocked. I just opened the door thinking it was a closet and it was a tunnel. So that could be problematic if there were people coming and going and you were up on the third floor. So, but um, really they're all over. Um, I have signed non-disclosure agreements with several family neighborhoods where they do connect. So, and I really hope that we can, you know, at some point in time, really understand those better because they're kind of, they're family treasures. They're celebrated by family. And um, so that would be something that if, if we lost those, that would be sad. Any other questions? I'm gonna be available afterwards. I would love to chat. Um, and you're more than welcome to stay for drinks. I know some of you purchased the dinner tickets, and so dinner will be available up here afterwards. So, um, but anyways, um, I thank you so much. Um, this is gonna be a fun series. And if you have any questions about any of the other speakers about what they're gonna talk about, just let me know. I'm really excited, because then I get to be in the audience.